Okay, so let's start off with the oxygen or airway in our review. SpO2, uh, partial pressure of oxygen in the capillary bed. Remember, it's the little finger probe that goes on the end. It measures uh, the partial pressure of oxygen in that capillary bed. Uh, things will affect this, the SpO2 or pulse oximetry or pulse ox. It's, it's known, known as uh, quite a few cold hands like I have right now will affect the pulse oximetry. Fingernail polish, uh, diabetes, things that causes uh, vasoconstriction is going to shock will affect the SpO2. Okay, so uh, but we, we try to get uh, this, the SpO2, the partial pressure of oxygen, you, you know the slang wet terms in it as the, the percent of oxygen in your blood, right? Saturation of oxygen in your blood, and that, that's sort of correct. That's the easier way to understand it, okay, even though it's a partial pressure. We want to get a SpO2 prior to administering oxygen. We want a room air SpO2 because this gives us a baseline. Without that, we have no baseline at if or when we apply oxygen. So we want to make sure that we get a room air SpO2. The normal is 95 to 100 percent. Anything below 94 percent, this is where we start into this evaluate the need for oxygen. Prior to about 2000, before you guys were born, okay, uh, Everybody got oxygen. It didn't matter. You got a stub toe, they put oxygen on you. Okay? If you get really bored in life and you want to read about why they changed this, it's, uh, it's because of the free radical ions that oxygen causes and damages tissue. So at about 2000, the year 2000, okay, seems so long ago. Uh, we started evaluating the need for oxygen. So if the patient has an SpO2 below 94% and has outward respiratory distress or complains of shortness of breath or respiratory problems, then we would more than likely apply oxygen. If we, when we look at this and we're sitting there and we're, we're evaluating this need, and we just apply oxygen, even in a heart attack or a stroke or trauma, it can still have a negative effect on tissue at the cellular level if they don't need oxygen. So at some point in your healthcare path, you'll have a class on these free radical ions. I just don't want to like do it to you. I'll let someone else abuse you with that, okay? Anyhow, so we're going to evaluate the need for oxygen and uh, get a room air SpO2. When we look at oxygen delivery, the first thing that we have to do is to identify the oxygen cylinder. So remember, the f we identify it three ways. One way is through uh, the color. It, it's either completely green or green and silver like this one, okay? It, if this was a, a, a real tank with oxygen in it, it would have a label on it that says oxygen. It would have one that says USP oxygen. US pharmacopoeia means it, it's a drug, okay? It's a medication. And so it'd have a label. And then the last thing to do, it has a two pin index system on the oxygen cylinder. This particular oxygen cylinder, okay, is a, it's a D cylinder, one that's portable. You have the long skinny ones, which are E, and the big H cylinders that are usually stuck behind the wall or something. But you have this two pin system there on the oxygen cylinder on the neck. This is only for medical grade oxygen. We, we use oxygen for other things like welding and, and different things of that nature, but this is for medical grade oxygen. It's, it's drier. Okay. So we have that two pin index system. So we have the color, okay? 
the label and the two pin index system which matches up with the regulator the two pins on the regulator got to float that in there okay what the regulator does is it regulates this oxygen coming out of the cylinder at 3,000 psi pounds per square inch so oxygen is measured in pounds per square inch and it regulates it down to something that's breathable, breathable that's a word, okay? And it does it by this large spring in the regulator. And then on the regulator itself, there's a large spring in here that compresses and makes the air where you can, the patient can actually breathe it. You have the leader flow on one side and then you have the gauge that it tells you how much oxygen is in the, in the cylinder. There's a red mark that says refill. That's your residual volume. So for sure, before you put it like a non-rebreather on somebody, you'd want to make sure that you have enough oxygen in there. At, when it's at 500 uh, PSI, so the non-rebreather will be used, used that oxygen up really quick. And so you want to make sure that uh, you have plenty of oxygen in your cylinder if you're using as portable. Oxygen is measured in liters per minute. So when, just like any medication, we have a indication, a contraindication, and then we have Okay, great interruption. Uh, wow. So we have we're going to we have different devices that allow us to deliver the oxygen at certain liters per minute. But what we have is the dose essentially for oxygen is measured in liters per minute. Now what we're trying to do with supplemental oxygen, because remember we breathe oxygen now, correct? What what percent are we breathing now in room air? 21. So we're breathing 21% room air percent or fraction. Remember the FiO2, fraction of inspired oxygen, FiO2. So our fraction of inspired oxygen or FiO2 right now without supplemental oxygen is 21%. So when we give a patient oxygen, we're adding to that percentage, okay? So the first one that we look at is a nasal cannula. It's the one that has the nasal prongs in it. Okay. The nasal prongs go in the nose, then it loops back over the ear. Okay. The dose for the nasal cannula is two to six liters per minute. <clears throat> in practical medicine, about four liters is about all that you want to put a nasal cannula because it's really dry and it gets uncomfortable all that air blowing up somebody's nose okay but the books do say two to six liters per minute it increases the FiO2 fraction of inspired oxygen from 21 percent on room air to 24 to 40 percent somewhere in there there's such a, a big variety of percent between that because the you're breathing in mixed gases so you're breathing in carbon dioxide so you mix these gases together okay anyhow uh, the indication because like with any medication that we give we have to have an indication so the indication for a nasal cannula 
It's mild respiratory distress. So you have someone there, maybe they're breathing a little fast, they're still breathing through their nose, they're not mouth breathing yet, so they're breathing through their nose, okay? Maybe their rate's up a little bit, okay? Something of that nature, but they're just real mild respiratory distress. So if you were to, like on a scale of one to 10, if you were to judge it that way, you would, they, this person would be like a two or a three. Or maybe they're having the four or five word dysmia where they're having to take a breath every four or five words. That sort of mild, severe dysmia would be one word respiratory, uh, one word dysmia. It means they have to take a breath every, every word, right? And so the nasal cannula is widely used uh, for mild respiratory distress. The simple face mask is not that used anymore just because of economics. It's used more in pediatric patients. Uh, it will increase the FiO2 to 44 to 60%. So it's good, but it's still, you because of this gap here of the percentage, you're, the patient is breathing in and out carbon dioxide. So they're mi mixing oxygen, carbon dioxide together, mixing those gases, which lowers the percent of oxygen. The, the dose or the liter flow is six to 10, that, that almost looks like 101, but it's six to 10 liters per minute on the simple face mask, usually around six. So you have a variety. Now keep in mind when, when you're doing your assessments, okay, one liter of change in oxygen won't do anything. Okay, so if you're having a patient that has, you know, some trouble breathing and you have them on a nasal cannula and you go from three, which is my favorite number to give, okay, to four, it won't do any good. Okay, you might bump it up to six, but if you need to, if they're still having trouble breathing on a nasal cannula, you'll probably have to go up to the next device, like a mask, okay, especially if they're mouth breathing. But that's a simple face mask. And uh, like I said, widely used in pediatrics, not so much used in adults just because of economics. And when we look at this non-rebreather, that will uh, uh, let you know that this is why they just, they want to just buy the non-rebreather instead of two different masks. The indication, back to the simple face mask, the indication for a simple face mask would be moderate respiratory distress. So you have that patient that's, they're sort of, they're using some accessory muscles. They may have three word dysmia. You know, they're really struggling to, they, the work of breathing is up. So they're having to work a little bit to, to breathe. Okay, so that simple, simple face mask. Is severe respiratory distress or moderate? Say what? Is it moderate respiratory distress or severe? It's a moderate moderate for the uh, non-simple face mask. I, don't, I didn't have that up there, but simple face mask is moderate respiratory uh, distress. The non-rebreather, which is the most common, and this and that does really replace the, uh, the uh, simple face mask. It, Teachers, pardon the interruption. Uh, if you sent a student down for a dose code violation, they should return with a pink slip. Students should return with a pink slip. Thank you. The difference is that you would note between a, a non-rebreather is the reservoir bag. One of the goals in using a non-rebreather is to make sure that this reservoir bag stays inflated. This, this is that way they can breathe this pure oxygen here. On this, I don't have one on, on this particular non-rebreather, so this is actually what would be considered a partial non-rebreather, but there's valves that adhere to the side of the mask. So when they breathe in, the patient breathes in, these valves sort of adhere to the side of the mask, and this valve that's on the inside will, will raise up, and the patient is breathing primarily Okay, oxygen. 
the, the carbon dioxide is cut off with breathing in the carbon dioxide is cut off with these outlet valves on the side of the mask so that when the patient has it on there they breathe in these mat these inlet valves will like I said pull towards the mask and seal that off and then this one here will come up and allow the oxygen out of the reservoir bag to come out in the mask just so you mix less gases so you're prime with a non rebreather mask you're primarily breathing uh, oxygen and not uh, it doesn't mix as much carbon dioxide the leader flow is 10 to 15 liters per minute you can have I usually start at 10 if that will keep the reservoir bag full and if it they collapse the bag with inspiration okay then I'll go up to 15 after 15 you're going to have to have something different okay you don't have to use a bag valve mask okay. if it's over the nose it clamps there for a good seal and again we want to make sure uh, that we keep the reservoir bag at least two-thirds inflated when the patient takes a breath in before you place a non rebreather mask on the patient you would fill the reservoir bag first so you'd hook this end of the oxygen hold the uh, the valve down let the reservoir bag fill and then you place it on the patient okay uh, you see it on TV all the time with this on their face with this in this uh, flattened reservoir bag right that's that's why it's TV okay. that would be against your standard of care to put a non rebreather on somebody without oxygen in the reservoir bag so 10 to 15 liters per minute but look at the difference in the FiO2 90 to 95 percent so it's a big difference it's a smaller gap because they don't mix we don't we're not mixing gases we're not mixing that carbon dioxide level so 90 to 95 percent in the indication would be severe respiratory distress so this patient is is they're using accessory muscles their rate is increased they're having a trouble a work of breathing they're having trouble breathing and uh, their their mouth breathing and so they would uh, use the non rebreather mask for that patient questions there okay All right. the bag valve mask is the last one I think we have for here yep is uh, we would use a bag valve mask for a patient with severe respiratory distress add in there pending respiratory failure so this patient is about to stop breathing okay let me grab a, a bag valve mask So severe respiratory distress or pending respiratory failure so maybe this patient has a rate of six right that's pending respiratory failure they're about to stop breathing okay, they're retaining a lot of co2 and they're about to stop breathing or respiratory arrest they've stopped breathing okay. just like the non rebreather has a reservoir bag that we need to fill up it takes about 15 liters of oxygen to fill this reservoir bag up and as we squeeze the bag and release it squeeze and release okay, uh, we want to make sure the reservoir bag stays inflated <clears throat> there's there's an adult bag valve mask like we have here a child and an infant okay, so uh, we want to use the proper bag valve mask on the proper patient this at this bag bag and you hear a little click in there maybe the valve and the mask so, so bag valve mask okay has about a 500 milliliter volume to it and that equals the approximate tidal volume of an adult okay tidal volume is the amount of oxygen approximate amount of oxygen that a person inhales with one breath so uh, for an average adult it's 500 milliliters and so the bag it's a 500 milliliter bag so when you squeeze it and release it you're administering 500 milliliters or a good tidal volume 
That's why there's different size bags and there's also different size bass that we have. Here, depending upon if the patient's intubated, then you get more uh, of 100%, but it increases that FO2 95 to 100% with the dose of 15 liters plus, like 15, 20 liters perhaps. It doesn't really take much more than that. So you, you want to make sure that the, uh, the bag stays inflated. Those are the oxygen delivery devices. Any, any questions there? We're good. failure, pending respiratory failure. So severe respiratory distress, pending respiratory failure, or respiratory arrest. Suctioning is also part of airway, okay? So when we look at suctioning, uh, when we, we broke it down, the other video, we broke it down, some of those questions about secretion. So you have a question or you have a patient with a lot of secretions or they may have vomitus, or they may have blood or something in their airway. So suctioning is part of airway management. Uh, we, when we go to suction a patient, we, uh, in, in, in like in a test question, the, you, you have a patient that has respiratory distress, blah, 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 and his airway is full of secretions, or you hear gurgling. Suctioning is the priority, so you would suction that patient before you would start like bag bagging that patient. And you want to make sure that you clear the airway first, so you'd suction. There's a time limit on suctioning. Uh, per the book, about 15 seconds. For an adult, it's less than that. Uh, for pediatric, it's closer to 10 seconds. For a pediatric, the, dip, the, bulk, the books vary with, with the times, but most of them say about 15 seconds for an adult because what happens with suctioning, uh, it creates a vagal or it can create a vagal response. It, it activates the vagus nerve, which drops the heart rate. So either we want to make sure that we monitor the heart rate, either by with the EKG or pulse to make sure that uh, the heart rate's not dropping when we're suctioning or we just want to limit the suctioning to 15 seconds. Book-wise, test-wise, 15 seconds for an adult because of the uh, potential of creating a vagal response. When we're doing the skill itself, remember that we suction on the way out. So we leave the suction off. We measure the suction uh, catheter like a Yonkers or a hard tip suction. We would measure that from the tip of the ear to the tip of the mouth, and then we would go in, and then we would suction for no longer than 15 seconds on the way out. Once we've finished suctioning, then we need to oxygenate the patient because this is going to cause a little hypoxia. Remember, hypoxia is the lack of oxygen to the cells. Okay? And, and so the... Uh, to offset the hypoxia, we're, we're going to oxygenate the patient, the suctioning. Most suctions are, are vac vacuumed, the powered suctions, and then we have handheld suction. But it, it's the same procedure, whether you're doing it manual or electronic, okay? We uh, suction for 15 seconds and we suction on the way out. You don't, ev don't ever lose the distal tip of your suction device. So you always want it like the Yonkers tip, the hard tip, you always want to keep the distal tip in sight, okay? And that's, that's one of the benefits of measuring as well. But do watch out for the uh, vagal response. Uh, and it's very important in a pediatric patient not to, not to create that vagal response and drop the heart rate. Heart rate is more critical in a pediatric patient than an adult patient. All right, good for airway. Quick sort of fire hose trip through there, but like I said, it's just sort of a, a, a review.
Let's look at the types of shock. Shock, by definition, is the inability uh, for the body inadequate. Let me, okay, start over again. The definition for shock is the inability for the body to uh, supply oxygen and nutrients to the cells. So the nutrients would be glucose or and then the inability to supply oxygen and nutrients. It's also uh, known as per hypoperfusion. I don't use that very often, but hypoperfusion is the inability of the body to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the cells. So we have shock and we have these different types of shock. Hypovolemic, uh, hypo meaning volume, all right? And then volemic, I mean hypo meaning low, then volemic volume, so hypovolemic, low volume, can either be blood or fluid loss. Uh, keep in mind pediatrics can go into hypovolemic shock through vomiting and diarrhea. So can we, so can adults. Right? You can have a worst case scenario like with a food poisoning or something where uh, you lose a lot of volume and you can go in hypovolemic shock. It's also known as hemorrhagic shock as far as blood, just blood loss is concerned, but hypovolemic shock, hemorrhagic shock, the difference is just uh, uh, hemorrhagic shock is blood loss and then hypovolemic shock is blood or fluid. Most people just use hypovolemic shock. The other type of shock that we, next one that we have listed is psychogenic. This is like fainting. It's like going to the freezer and re realizing that the Someone has put an empty bucket of bluebell in there, right? You go and you open the lid and it, it frightens you so bad that you pass out. Uh, needles, different things, uh, blood. We just talked about phlebotomy, so someone can have psychogenic shock from the, the side of blood and they, they have a syncopal episode or they faint. It's self-correcting. Once the patient lays supine, that's fainted, uh, the body corrects the, the blood pressure problem and uh, their blood pressure goes back up. The other type is cardiogenic or the pump failure. Most of the time cardiogenic shock is, is fatal, but we have a pump failure either through uh, a sudden maybe uh, congestive heart failure, heart failure, sudden onset of heart failure, or through an EMI, myocardial infarction or heart attack. They have a pump problem. So the pump itself is the problem. The pump is not delivering the oxygen and nutrients to the cells. We, you know, we have the pump and we have the vessels. Okay, so vessels are working fine. In cardiogenic shock, the pump is not working. Uh, in an MI, what takes place, a lot of times you have a large surface MI, and uh, especially like an inferior MI or the bottom part of the heart, the bottom part of the heart is now infarcted or it's dead tissue, and the, remember the ventricles pump from upward, they push the blood upward, so if the inferior part of the heart is infarcted and it's a large surface area, then you're going to lose contractility, correct, through that. And if it's a very large surface, then the heart won't be able to contract at all. But any, any loss of contractility is going to decrease your cardiac output because keep in mind the formula for cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So stroke volume is the amount of blood that is ejected which, uh, during systole or during contraction in each ventricle. So we have during contraction, the ventricles contract and they eject on an average for an adult is 70 milliliters. 
So the average stroke volume for an adult is 70 milliliters. If we have a large surface MI, then that stroke volume decreases and we have a decrease in cardiac output, which would decrease the amount of oxygen and nutrients delivered to the cells. The other types of shock that we have uh, is distributive shock. This type of shock has, it, because of the massive vasodilation, the body has a hard time distributing the blood flow. It's distributive shock. No, no volume loss, okay, just vasodilation. The types of distributive shocks that we look at are anaphylactic shock, like from an a allergic reaction. You have neurogenic shock or spinal shock, from like a spinal cord injury. You have septic shock, right, from like a, a large bacterial infection or sepsis. Did I forget one? So we have anaphylaxis, anaphylactic shock, neurogenic, and then sepsis, then the distributive shock. Uh, we have all these kinds, K-I-N-S, that are uh, pushed out into the vessels during these distributive shocks that causes the uh, vasodilation. And then obstructive shock, again, a uh, pulmonary embolism. So you have, uh, you have an embolism that has uh, blocked a pulmonary capillary bed. So you have a PE or pulmonary embolism is uh, probably the most common type of, of obstructive shock. The key thing in all these, okay, key component is a drop in blood pressure Okay, you will note on a test question that the patient's in shock when the systolic blood pressure is below 100. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you will see, the other sign that you will see in shock is a sustained tachycardia. So before you have a drop in blood pressure, you're gonna have a sustained tachycardia. The body itself is gonna compensate by increasing the heart rate we increase the heart rate, we increase cardiac output. So it's gonna to try to compensate for that with the sustained tachycardia. And then as we enter into decompensated shock, which I believe is on the next slide. So we have compensatory shock or compensated shock, which the body through the elevation of the heart rate is compensating either for the dilation or the loss of fluid. Okay. So it's compensating and it's keeping the blood pressure up. So you don't have a sustained tachycardia, but this patient in compensated shock is going to be normal tensive. So their blood pressure is going to remain normal okay, during compensated shock, but they have the increase in heart rate. When the patient decompensates, that's where you see the, the blood pressure dropped below 100 systolic, and, but the heart rate still stays up. It, they're, they're, they're still trying to compensate somewhat, but they're in a decompensation period where the heart rate stays up, but the blood pressure begins to drop below 100 systolic. Then you have irreversible shock. That is when the heart rate drops. Now you have a profound bradycardia, remember bradycardia, less than 60, right? Tachycardia, greater than 100. So in irreversible shock, now you have a profound bradycardia in hypotension. So the patient's hypotensive and they're bradycardia, bradycardic, and it's irreversible. Uh, there's a lot more physiology that goes into that, dealing with the pre- and post-capillary sphincters that we will learn during cardiac physiology, but uh, it's, it's irreversible. So you have these different 
you have these different forms of shock and then you have the different stages of shock. Our treatments at and it varies at level to level, okay? One of the first things that we want to do is to keep the patient warm. Uh, the body loses or decreases the ability to clot if the patient's not kept warm. So in, even in North Texas in August, we're going to use warming measures. We're going to cover our patient, okay? We're going to keep them warm. We're going to evaluate the need for oxygen, so signs of respiratory distress, SpO2 less than 94. We're going to apply a high concentration of oxygen. Depending on, upon your skill set or your scope of practice, we may uh, replace that fluid or fill that vascular space with normal saline, sort of a temporary fix to keep the blood pressure up, okay? It's temporary till we fix the problem. Okay. Or they may administer blood, something to fill that vascular space. In a distributive shock where there's not any fluid loss and no trauma, we use a medication to cause vasoconstriction. I uh, just mentioned a couple, dopamine or levofed, they're very powerful uh, vasoconstrictor so they use the medicine itself to to vasoconstrict and through that vasoconstriction we have an increase in pressure through the replacement of volume we have an increase in pressure all these are temporary measures until we fix the problem so if the patient's bleeding then we fix the bleeding problem okay? if they're in anaphylactic shock then we have fixed the allergic reaction problem that they're having, right? Sepsis, we fix the bacterial infection. We start administering antibiotics. We keep the blood pressure up. We administer antibiotics okay, and uh, fix the uh, sepsis. Uh, any questions there? We're okay. Oh, we'll do cardiac and then we'll take a break. This would be a good place to, to break off. <clears throat> Acute coronary syndrome, uh, ACS is just a phrase that they use when we start, talk about cardiac related chest pain. Okay. So we have this patient this cardiac patient and they're having cardiac related chest pain. It starts out most of the time with this process of arterial sclerosis. When we're young, we have this nice open vessel. There's no pressure problems. There's not a lot of plaque problems. And as we eat more and more bluebell, we move towards building up plaque. This plaque also in these vessels decreases the elasticity of the vessel. So no longer can the vessel expand and contract the way it used to. And also, because as it narrows, it builds up pressure, which could also break part of that plaque off and cause a clot, okay? Like in a coronary artery, where we patient would have a potential heart attack, right? So you have that, this arterial sclerosis, is just the process over a long period of time uh, of the narrowing of the artery where you get over here to the end and you have very little blood flow through there but you have a lot of pressure and you have a lot of plaque buildup so it takes away the elasticity of that artery as well. When we look at cardiac related chest pain uh, it's different than respiratory chest pain we'll talk about that probably another day, right? but you have substernal or pressure that's underneath the sternum or in the center of the chest. Uh, a lot of times the patient will describe it feels like someone's squeezing me or sitting on me. They might even say it feels like you're sitting on me. Okay? It's this pressure type pain. 
when you're assessing this this type of pain it's important that in anything in the chest any abnormal feeling in the chest we consider as pain it's not the type of pain like if I take my golf club and, and hit you in, in the shin okay that's a different type of pain okay so the you you might have patients saying I don't feel any pain at all but this pressure in my chest is killing me that's the same that's the same as pain okay so it's that pressure type pain uh, feels like someone's sitting on you or uh, squeezing you the other it may radiate down the arms or legs at the back neck jaw both arms uh, left arm uh, typical it's sort of a classic so you have this substernal pain pressure type pain it's radiating into my arm and back and neck neck and then you get shorter breath so you have dysmia with it so shortness of breath nausea and vomiting is not there but we also always know when there's nausea vomiting will usually follow and diaphoresis or sweating and then weakness the, the patient feels weak weakness comes from they're having this cardiac event and they're not uh, it, it's decreasing their cardiac output so when we look back pressure top pain radiating pain in the jaws and back arms okay shortness of breath nausea and vomiting diaphoresis and weakness when you have about two of those you have a patient that's having a heart attack until proven otherwise and we'll, we'll get into that in a bit okay so we if they're having pressure top pain and they're nauseated and shortness of breath short of breath then they're having a heart attack until proven otherwise. So we have those signs and symptoms, and these signs and symptoms are the same whether the patient's having angina or angina, depends on where you live, right? Uh, or they're having a heart attack, they're having an MI. The, the, all the symptoms are the same with the exception of once you start treating the patient for the pain, angina usually goes away with the with the nitro where if they're having an mi the pain won't subside so if there's uh we'll get into that when we talk about the two types of angina pectoris or angina uh, you have stable and unstable stable remember we we, we made up this story about this cardiac patient they they've been prescribed nitroglycerin you know the the tablets that patients take if nitroglycerin causes vasodilation and increases blood flow around a blockage or a constriction and so they have stable angina or predictable angina so this patient here that has stable angina when they're out mowing their lawn or they're, they're doing something that's maybe they decided not to uh, ride in the golf cart that day and they, they carry their golf clubs, right? And so they're walking along the uh, fairway and they start having chest pain. And it, it's that pressure type pain. They may get a little short of breath with it, right? But they remember that their cardiologist told them with, when you have this exertion, you're going to have this type of chest pain, this pressure type pain, a little shortness of breath with it. So what we want you to do is to stop what you're doing. So stop whatever's causing the exertion, rest, and then take a nitro tablet. Uh, remember nitro is given sublingual, 0.4 milligrams sublingual, and it causes vasodilation so it's going to cause a, uh, the patient <clears throat> vessels all the vessels to dilate which in turn is going to drop their blood pressure so when you're administering nitro remember you have to have a blood pressure 
above 100 systolic before you administer nitro. Okay, but that's stable angina. So this patient, <clears throat> they're out there, they're carrying their clubs for some foolish reason. They start having the chest pain. They go to the bench, they, they rest a little bit, they pop a nitro, pain goes away. Okay, stable, very stable, predictable. Okay, you have the same patient now that's home watching that, uh, that exciting gut-wrenching turn golf tournament. Right? You just can't hardly, he's standing on the edge of his seat wondering who's gonna win, right? But he's at rest. This patient's at rest. There's no exertion here. Uh, or maybe the patient's at sleeping. That's a, uh, if, the, if the pain wakes the patient up from a sleep or there's no exertion and they start having this pressure type pain, shortness of breath, maybe a little nausea, then it's, become, it's considered unstable angina or USA, unstable angina. Okay, so the, uh, this is a true medical emergency. This patient needs to contact their uh, cardiologist. I recommend that this patient go be evaluated by ambulance, okay, uh, because they're having this unstable angina. So there's no exertion in it. Uh, the, what they're going to do is the same. They're going to take the nitro, they're going to rest, even though they're at rest, they're going to try to rest some more, take a nitro to see if it will go away. With the stable, hypothetically, with the stable angina, I mean, you're looking at, you know, maybe one tablet in some rest. Unstable angina, they're, re they're at rest. They take two, maybe three. In, in, it will go away, but it's unstable or unpredictable. Everybody good with the two, the, the two different ones? So we have stable angina, unstable angina, and then we have, uh, I just put that up there because I thought it was so cool. Is that a cool picture? Yeah, of all the uh, arteries. Now what we have, the next one, is someone having an actual heart attack. So in one of these big arteries, uh, like the widow maker here, that goes all the way down the inferior part of the left ventricle, has, breaks off and has a clot. So there's a blockage there now. So there's not getting any distal blood flow down uh, through there. What is the time again? 20 minutes before they, the tissue's dead? Something like that? Okay. So 20 minutes without perfusion, this tissue is going to infarct. So uh, now they have the big clot there that's, that's keeping distal blood flow. So they're having the MI, or acute myocardial infarction, or AMI. The signs and symptoms are the same. So this patient that's having this heart attack, or this MI, Okay, it's still going to have pressure type pain, shortness of breath, nausea vomiting, radiating pain, diaphoresis, all that's going to be the same. They're taking the nitro, they're resting, okay, but there's no relief. So typically in an MI, the patient's not going to get any relief with the nitrates. To get relief, you're going to either have to fix the blockage or uh, increase your treatment <clears throat> some. Because as you see on the side, right in here, all this distal uh, tissue from the clot is not receiving blood, so it's infarcting. So this is gonna be dead tissue, again, uh, 20 minutes or so. Don't quote me on the number, but I think that's it from the con video. Oh. So this patient here, having this MI, then, then they would need to go to the cardiac cath lab. They need to go get that uh, 
that vessel opened up, put a stent in there, removed that clot. Okay. Other things that you might see, okay, it's like we said, the squeezingness or the heaviness, the palpitations. Uh, I got palpitations this weekend playing golf for some reason. Okay, my heart sort of, like, you, you guys drink those energy drinks and it, you, your heart just sort of, like, beats out of your chest. That's palpitations, okay? okay. Or a flutter in it, except radiating down one or both, both arms. Dysmia, nausea. <clears throat> the patient will know that there's something wrong here, okay? And so they're going to have this feeling of doom, this anxiety that's built up because they, they know something's wrong. Same way with shock, they're going to have this anxiety because they they understand that something's wrong with their their body. Questions there? Okay. Vomiting. You get irregular heart rhythms uh, with in an MI, uh, both tachycardia and bradycardia. It just depends on what part of the heart's affected. And then these abnormal pressures that they talk about is if the patient goes into cardiogenic shock. Hey, so if someone's having a heart attack, they could have what's called a STEMI. A STEMI is ST elevation myocardial infarction. ST, ST which is the ST segment on the EKG. Uh, Elevation, myocardial infarction. So we look at this 12 lead here, and this one's color coded for us, so we can see the ST elevation in the different leads. So if we look here in lead two and three in AVF, okay, we see the ST elevation. So when they do a 12 lead on the patient, <clears throat> this is going to show up with the ST segment, which is the segment uh, past the uh, S wave on the EKG and right before the T wave, okay? So you have the ST segment and that's going to be elevated. It's going to look like an elevator. So in a second here, we'll have a picture of this J point, but this J point or this ST segment is going to go straight up. That's the way that you know it's elevation. It sort of goes up uh, like an elevator. We look, when we look at a 12 lead, we look for ST elevation in two or more consecutive leads. These leads are broke down in like this color chart uh, because you can have a, a heart attack or an infarction on any surface of the heart. So the, a 12 lead essentially looks at these different views, okay, uh, looking for electrical disturb disturbances on the, uh, in the heart. So 2, 3, and AVF is the inferior to the bottom part of the heart. The lateral part is the uh, Lead one, a, uh, AVL, and then five and six. Okay. Eventually, you need to know this for the PCT stuff, okay? But not, not right now. And then interior, you have uh, V3, v, uh, V4. So in a STEMI, ST elevation uh, MI, then uh, we'd look for as to elevation in two more consecutive leads. And I promised, here's the J point. So this part right here uh, is the ST segment. And then the J point is the beginning or uh, where the QRS wave ends, okay, at this point right here. And this J point and S T elevation will go straight up. The difference in here, like on this one at V2, see this doesn't go straight up, it's more of a slope. So on a, on a 12 lead interpretation, you can get fooled sometimes thinking 
that this here is ST elevation, but it's more of a slope. And there's a, uh, a number of reasons why you would have that slope, that it just, it wouldn't be a heart attack or an ST, uh, a STEMI. All right. So they can go in and they can dilate it. They can put a stent in there. They can put a balloon in there. They can do a cabbage or a graft that bypasses the obstruction. So there's several different things that they can actually do for someone having a, a MI. But our treatment, okay, when we look at it, we want to uh, we want to evaluate. Do the ABCs always? Do our good sample, our OPQRST, get that good assessment going. But we want to do a 12 lead right away to see if, if it's a STEMI, because you can have a non-STEMI, and a non-STEMI is where there's patients still having the same signs and symptoms as a heart attack, okay? <coughs> but no ST elevation. But they're still having a heart attack. They're having a non-STEMI. So we want to do a 12 lead. We want to evaluate the need for oxygen. We want to administer aspirin, which is the ASA. Aspirin here is used as a anticoagulant or a blood thinner. Okay, so we want to thin that blood down okay, so it can get past that obstruction. We administer nitroglycerin uh, spray or tablet, 0.4 milligrams sublingual, remembering so when we administer nitro, it will drop the blood pressure. You'll be introduced to something called Darcy's Law uh, in cardiac physiology that's going to explain why nitroglycerin always drops the blood pressure. And so the, uh, it's a vasodilator, the class of medication. And so we're going to administer nitro up to three times every five minutes. And what this does, uh, it decreases the workload of the heart. On a lot of these medications that we're about to talk about here, it decreases the workload of the heart. So if that patient is having an MI, that's one of the goals that you want to do. You want to decrease that workload, okay, uh, of the heart. It's just the same way with carrying a lot of weight on your backpack, right? So you have a lot of weight. If you're having trouble carrying the weight, you want someone to come along, take some of the weight off of you, so you have to work less. Someone having a heart attack, we don't want that heart uh, muscle working hard uh, and then requiring more oxygen that it doesn't have. So it's a vasodilator, uh, up to three doses, every five minutes, make sure you check blood pressures in between. We can administer beta blockers, again, depending upon your scope of practice. A beta blocker is going to slow the heart rate down. Uh, so if we have a heart rate, usually above, it's above 70, it'd be a contraindication to give a beta blocker of a heart rate below 70. But if uh, we have a faster heart rate, we may give a beta blocker to slow that heart rate down block those beta responses uh, to decrease the workload of the heart. And then the last medication is morphine. And beta blockers and morphine are given IV. The nitro is given sublingual. We can give morphine. And the reason that we give morphine is the same. We want to decrease the workload of the heart okay. when we uh, when we talk about our treatment. And then ultimately, if this patient is having a STEMI or they're having a heart attack, we want to get them to the cath lab and, uh, to do the stent. All right, any questions? You guys good? I know that was really quick and a lot of information, but uh, I said it's just sort of a, the first part of the review. Once. Uh, the next section that we're going to pick up, not today, but the next section that we're going to pick up is uh, 
we'll start with congested heart failure and move through the respiratory process, okay? Everybody good? Questions?